My name is Sam Metcalf, and I'm a master's student at Galton. And I'm here to talk to you about uh, how art gives language to our thoughts so that we can find meaning from the information that's given to us by our eyes and brain. So here we have a picture of a lion. Uh, this is a picture drawn by Villard de Hanacourt, who was an architect in the 13th century. And uh, we know from Villard's sketchbooks that when he drew this lion, he was looking at a real live lion. And this is what he came up with. Now, to us, this looks like a cartoon. It's a caricature of what a lion would look like. And obviously, we have very different notions from what drawing from life means than Villard did. But Villard's eyes and brain are physically the same as our own. And what we have here is an example of a medieval schema for what a lion should look like to someone like Villard. Because from Villard's experience, he's drawing on the art tradition of his time in how to depict animals and creatures and places. And so he makes the information that comes to him conform to an idea that is familiar. Here, we've jumped ahead about 600 years in time. Uh, we're into the 1800s, and we're looking at a painting by Cezanne. This is a chateau at Medan, and Cezanne was a pioneer in his time. We're presented here with the first real break in the visual arts from the idea that representation in art was the sum of light. And Cezanne famously said, to see is not enough. One must think as well. And so with Cezanne's pictures, we're going to go through the story of sight. When light off of this screen hits your eyes, it's split into two electrical signals in the striate cortex of your visual cortex, which is called the V1 region. Your visual cortex is split into five regions, which progressively refine light. But when light hits this first region, it's split into two signals. One goes straight to your prefrontal cortex very, very quickly. And this is the area of the brain normally associated with conscious thought. The other electrical signal continues to pass through the five regions of the visual cortex. But interestingly enough, from this initial quick sketch of information that goes straight to your prefrontal cortex, your brain then sends a message to the visual cortex and alters the electrical signals passing through your visual cortex. And it's made to conform to your concepts about what you are seeing. So here we have a picture of some trees and houses and landscape along a river. And it's given form from just colors and contours and daubs of paint. And Cezanne obsessively worked on char characterizing the essential elements of a scene in order for people to form a mental representation of what was being depicted. This is another painting by Cezanne done about 14 years later in his career. Here, we have something even more abstract. There's less definition in shapes and objects. We have fields of open color, but we still get a distinct impression of a landscape. We can see the stones that Cezanne was looking out onto. We can see the sky and the trees and the plants that he was trying to depict to us. Now, this is an excellent example of what visual information looks like when it's about halfway through your visual cortex. It's been processed by your brain, and it's starting to get the boundaries of definition, but it's not as well defined as our previous image. This is a painting by Cezanne done in the last year of his life. Here we have another landscape scene of the Mount Saint Victor. Now, this scene has just the barest essential elements of contour and color value, but we can still distinctly see the mountain. We feel a landscape, and we can see the space presented before us. This is like what the image of light is going straight to your prefrontal cortex. Your visual cortex hasn't had time to apply complex depth information or differentiation from objects. And this is the kind of image that your brain is using to decide what you're seeing. Modern neuroscientists have begun to look back on historical artworks in order to better understand the brain. This is a painting by Henri Matisse in preparation for his seminal work, The Joy of Living. Now, with a work like this, we can still see contours and objects. We see people and a park, and we can see the sky and plants around us. 
but these things are colored completely unlike anything that we're used to in the natural world. Now, modern researchers in employing a work like this have had test subjects look at paintings that are naturally colored and look at paintings like the work of Matisse and they can see that although we arrive at the same mental representations of landscapes and ideas about what we are, are looking at, we light up entirely different sections of the brain when they're differently colored like this. And this has helped researchers understand how the brain picks out and emphasizes different colors and how we find objects out in the world. Now the importance of the conceptual space in which we pour information into is critical. Subjects who have had damage to the V1 region in their eyes cannot find form out of the world of light. So one such subject was presented with a rose and his description of it was, I see these blobs of red color and a lateral green slash cutting across my visual plane. And this was his understanding of a rose. But upon smelling it, he instantly recognized what the object was. Now his eyes are receiving the same exact light as our own, but without the connection to his brain to give it form, he had no idea what he was holding was actually an object. In this way, art presents not only a way for us to categorize and understand the world around us, but it also creates entirely new visual experiences which researchers and artists can employ to understand how the brain and eyes actually function. This is a work by Barbara Nessen done in 1993. Now, I want everybody to cross your eyes so that the two images, left and right, overlap and focus, try to focus on where they overlap in the middle between the two images. Now, this process is awkward and you might not be able to do it, but try. Now, if you've gotten this to work successfully, you'll be able to see this image in three-dimensional depth, which we'll also call binocular depth. And this is a way to artificially reproduce the way that the human being experiences depth in the real world. Normally this happens because of the slight space between your eyes. Each eye is given a different angle of light information and your brain combines these together into a perception of depth in the world. What we have here is this effect artificially recreated by slightly offsetting the position of the different points and elements in the plane and so you get a reconstructed 3D image. This is called stereographic art. And it is my interest in my masters at Gallatin um, to continue exploring the arena of stereographic art because it presents a unique potential to understand the brain and how we understand space. This is a work by M.C. Escher called Relativity and it presents a kind of space which is paradoxical to our normal experience. It has lines and perspectives and physics which can exist in the real world. Now, this is a two-dimensional image, but it is my intention with my master's work to build an environmental installation so that a space like this can be presented stereographically. If such a thing were made possible, we could literally occupy a paradoxical space and learn more both about how we conceive of space and give it meaning and also understand how the brain processes this kind of information for a new visual language into the future. Thank you.